Hello, everyone. No, I'm not the same gnome you may know, but believe me, I'm an engineer. No beard, but still. And while our gnome is messing around with CRPTs, we'll speak about why we need retro monitors, and then we'll bring a brand new project to life. And the sponsor of this episode is PCBWay, a place where you can make a PCB the easy way, or even order to design it. The price starts from $5 for 10 pieces. PCBWay has also CNC machining and 3D printing services. Check it out. All right, we've got a Commodore, a Soviet BK, which Gnome still cannot get to. But there's one thing which is absolutely crazy. So, what to start with? Why don't you start from the beginning? Well, in the beginning there was a word, and the word was 16 bits or 2 bytes. And the lower byte had a smaller address, and the higher byte had a bigger one. Uh, from another beginning. Well, first we need to go back in time to the 80s. We are doomed to return to this epoch over and over, because it's completely defined the look and feel of modern computers. And unlike today's mainstream, that was a time of created search and variety of architectures. So, from the mid-80s, instead of 8-bit systems that were making users excited just recently, 32-bit monsters started to arise with 512k of memory or even the entire megabyte. Sounds funny, doesn't it? IBM PC will not even mention. Back then, it was just one of the many and its capabilities were not far beyond the 8 bits. An interesting fact to note. The first 32-bit home computer appeared to be not the Macintosh 128K, as we used to think, but the creation of Clive Sinclair, Sinclair QL. It came out just 12 days before, but was a commercial failure. Made in a great hurry, it turned up buggy and terribly unreliable. And of course, among all that variety, we cannot miss out DEC PDP-11 architecture, which is now undeservedly forgotten. So let's pay our tribute to it, because everything that we widely use nowadays comes straight from there. Decode, please. For example, what? For example, everything. Terminal standards, for instance, that we still use in every Unix Linux system. These standards originate from the teletypes connected to PDP machines, and that's why there are plenty of control characters there, like carriage return. Another example is Unix, which was born on the PDP-11. Yet another one is the C language. It was created for PDP-11. Why do you think there is still plus plus PDP-11 stuff in C language? To top this, direct memory access, united address space, virtual interrupts, the TCPIP stack, all of those came to us from PDP-11. Enough? And for those who are interested, we recommend the article What have we learned from the PDP-11? We'll give a link in the description. So, with this platform, it is obvious that we just couldn't pass it by. Around late 70s, early 80s, the enterprises of the Soviet Ministry of the Electronic Industry were actively working on 16-bit processors. The decision was taken to adapt the existing single-chip system 1801VE1 for the PDP-11 instruction set compatibility. That's how the Soviet microprocess K1801VM1 was born. And later on, in 1983, Scientific Center of Zelenograd introduced an absolute legend, BK0010.01 home computer. Hey, no, when you're gonna get BK fixed? They keep asking. I'll start uh, when I start. Uh, maybe one day, someday. K1801VM2 CPU became the next step in a successful product line. And in 1986, the information appeared mentioning development of a new computer in Zelenograd called PC-11. The computer was designed to work at 9 MHz CPU frequency. It had two 56K RAM, 128K ROM with a built-in BASIC and was meant to be partially compatible with MSX on the level of BASIC. And in 1987, the ubiquitous MS0511 see had finally arrived. It's been built around a pair of K1801 VM2 CPUs, main and the peripheral one. The main microprocessor works at 8 MHz frequency, while the peripheral works at 6.25 MHz. 
The RAM size is 192 kilobytes, and only 56 are directly accessible by the user. It can display 8 colors from 16 color palette. There are 8 palettes by design. The screen resolution is 640 by 288. By throwing in a couple of bodge wires, you can mod MSO511 to output 53 unique colors. This microcomputer complex had been designed to be used in Soviet schools for educational purposes. More than 300,000 units have been produced. Unfortunately, the UKNC was notoriously unreliable compared to other Soviet micros. It has certain flaws in the board layout and is prone to overheating. But what can we do? Not every experiment becomes a success. Next chapter in this history was BK-0011, which came out in 1988 and its successor BK-0011M. They received a memory upgrade to 128 kilobytes and switchable color palettes. The same year, ION PC-1112 model was presented by Medion Company. The ION acronym stands for Information Services for People in Russia. Sadly, this machine is considered to be lost and there is no evidence of any samples remaining. We know that one of the divisions of electronical company Soyuz Technergo had ordered a bunch of PC-1112 to create 400 educational training centers. However, we don't know for certain whether this order ever reached production. We can barely speak of 10 units only. The parameters of the computer are unclear too. Judging by the demos that survived, it had CPU's performance of 1 million operations per second, a whole megabyte of memory, and could display more than 128 colors simultaneously. In 1990, the Quant factory launched the Soyuz Neon PC-1116, based on the 91806VM2 processor, which is a functional analog of K1801VM2, but produced with CMOS technology. The computer supports 512K to 4 MB of RAM and 16K of ROM. It produces a resolution of 832 by 300 with a variety number of dots per line, depending on the depth of shades from a palette of 65,536 colors. Very impressive characteristic for its time. IBM PC simply was no match. Unfortunately, the upcoming historical events put an end to the line of machines. Soviet engineers were concerned with survival and the local market was flooded with Amigas, Ataris and Apples. However, the artifact survived to the present days and got into the hands of retro enthusiasts, who had fixed the design flaws, drawn the improved schematics and remastered the PCB. They also started porting programs from the Soviet systems like BK, DVK, UKNC and finding the original software. So, we're joining the party and starting to build a Soyuz Neo. Well, in the first place, we need a main board. It's currently in revision 2.4. The board was sent to us by the author of the design, Volant. We really appreciate it. Then we need the case from UK and C, which is fully compatible with Neo. Don't pay attention to the yellowing. No said he's gonna retrobrite it. And last but not least, we need a whole bunch of gold. Literally. What do you think? It's Savitika. By the way, the person who's throwing this crazy idea into the nom's crazy head was Polonoshnik. Thank you, Polonoshnik. Now we're done to sneak around for the former Soviet Union looking for expensive and rare Soviet microchips, smugging them and sacrificing them to nom like a bloody ancient god. Hey, watch your words, or I'll burn you with hellfire. I think that's all for today. Next time, Noel will tell you about the technical details himself. Links to all resources related to the community will be in the description. Subscribe to the channel to follow the project, visit Telegram and maybe even Patreon if you can. That's all, folks. Bye!